Hagfish slime, I say. The hagfish is a very odd looking creature, as you can see now. It lacks taste buds, it lacks complex eyes, it lacks scales, and what it does most of the day is burrow into dead carcasses underwater and then absorb nutrients through its skin. It's so good at doing this that it absorbs more nutrients through its skin than it does when it's eating. Its skin is better than its intestines mm, for slurp em up. <laughs> But the weirdest thing about hagfish is their slime. Bear with me. When attacked, the hagfish release slime. And they can just release a little bit of this stuff, as you can see here, and it becomes a copious amount of goo. They release just a few milligrams of slime protein and expands tens of thousands of times in the water and becomes this stuff. And it's so weird. It is so soft that Jell-O is 100,000 times stiffer than that. Oh, and the proteins that the slime comes from are so tightly packed and they expand so much that they're 1% the width of a human hair and when they expand in water, they can get from that length, which is basically this, to four to six inches. This stuff is so weird that scientists had to create new machines just to test hagfish slime, and I want to touch it. Gimme that slime. Welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your comments, questions, and corrections and expand on them like hagfish slime expands in water. Someone let me touch one. And then I tell you what's coming up next on this channel. Hint. How is there not one? Hint. <laughs> But getting right down to it, in the last episode of Because Science, we are evaluating the most famous movie tagline in all of history, in space, <laughs> no one can hear you scream. I said that's not always true. There are more situations in which you could be in space and be heard screaming, I think, than situations where you would be never heard screaming, like the movie Alien implies. But what did you have to say? Our first big comment comes from many of you, like Spectre Gaming, Zukasa, Infinite Asim, who all say something like, well, isn't there also a way for something like an explosion to be heard in space? If you were close enough, wouldn't some ship's debris or even the gases inside of that ship impact the hull of your ship and produce some kind of sound? Wouldn't that be hearing sound in space? I agree, this would be some version of sound in space. So think of a ship exploding and its debris going off forever in all directions in straight lines, uh, given that it's not around some planet or going through an atmosphere or anything like that. That debris will eventually hit something. If that something is you, it's gonna impact your ship, vibrate the hull and vibrate the air on the inside of the hull, maybe if it's a hard impact, and then you'd be able to hear some kind of ding or something, probably not like that because your ship's not a bell, but and, and the, that would be some kind of sound in space. And if you were really, really close to a ship and it exploded, maybe those expanding gases would reach you in some kind of pressure wave before they dissipated to the void. Now, the pressure difference between something like inside of a spaceship, maybe one atmosphere if they're humanoids, and the void, space, is effectively from one atmosphere to zero atmospheres. And so, the air is going to expand and go off in all directions and lose that pressure very, very quickly. So I think the more likely scenario than hearing an explosion from the air of a ship exploding in space, you'd hear the sounds of debris hitting your ship. Like you can imagine uh, if you've ever been behind a large truck on the highway and it starts kicking up rocks and sand and you kind of hear that kind of sound, I think it would be something like that. But I do not think any of this will come close to the big stay on target, boom, kind of stuff that happened in Star Wars, as you could tell from my perfect impersonation of who was that? There were a lot of great comments on this episode, so for the next couple, I'm gonna try to answer them as quick as possible to get through many of them so I can feature all of you, and so we are gonna have a little bit of a lightning, lightning round. round. La 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 lightning round. <laughs> what am I, on Venus?
Okay, lightning round. Mr. Diglett says, what if you were to make a phone call on another planet? Would your voice still sound different? Love the show. Thank you. Yes, it would because the sound is still coming out of your mouth in that atmosphere first and then being transduced into an electrical signal that mimics those pressure waves. And then it, on the other side, on the other person who's receiving the phone call, the speaker uh, transduces those electrical signals back into pressure waves, which they hear, and it would be a lower frequency because that's what the microphone heard. Next, Miss Sweeze 560 says, you mentioned that the black hole sound wave, so along that line, would you be able to scream in something such as a nebula. No, nebulae in space are regions of collected gas and dust, and they are more gaseous than the rest of the surrounding interstellar medium, although nebulae are still very, very, very thin and rarefied. I've heard them described as if you were in the interstellar medium and then passed into a nebula, you wouldn't even notice the difference. So no, you still would not get a human-like suitless scream like you would here on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Lightning round. Our next comment comes from Phoenix Plays Games who says, Hey Kyle, ho ho, you. Uh, question on sound. I forgot. Why do sounds kill you when they exceed 220 decibels or something? Well, that is because of the sound pressure wave. When sounds get around 194 uh, decibels loud on Earth, the pressure wave starts mimicking a shock wave because those pressure waves are at or above atmospheric pressure already. And when those pressure waves hit your squishy, squishy insides, they can rupture them or damage them. They could cause your lungs to bleed or your eyes to smooth. Or your, <laughs> or your eardrums to rupture, and that's what ends up killing you. And at that point, it's not really a sound anymore. It's more like a brast wave. <laughs> Lightning round. Our next comment comes from Matthew Tomlinson, who says, Hey Kyle, huge fan. Oh, who says, I like that you explored the sound in, in this episode, but is it still a sound if a human ear cannot hear it? Well, yes, I would still categorize many things that you and I cannot hear as a sound. For example, the infrasound that elephants use to communicate with each other at long distances is definitely still a sound. The ultrasound that bats and uh, dolphins use to echolocate and communicate with each other are definitely still best categorized as sound. So even though we cannot hear it, I still think it makes a sound, which means... If a tree falls in a forest and it still creates pressure waves, even if you cannot hear it, I'd still describe it as a sound. Our next comment comes from Das99, who says, I was wondering, would it be possible to transmit sounds by selectively firing compressed air at someone? That's what speakers do. So no matter what you are listening to me on right now, whether it be your phone or your desktop or what have you, your television, the speakers in that device are vibrating at a certain rate, at a certain frequency, and they are pushing, physically pushing on the air around them, thanks to magnets that are going back and forth with alternating current. So those speakers are pressing on the air physically and compressing the air in front of them and letting the air behind that compression kind of uh, be rarefied, uh, relatively speaking, and that creates a moving pressure wave that eventually reaches your ears as sound. So yes, you can shoot compressed air at someone and have it be a sound. That's what speakers is. Lightning round. Our next comment comes from Emery Delva, who says, if you were in a gaseous nebula that happened to contain enough O2 molecules that you could breathe and enough pressure that you didn't explode, could you be heard in that too? You are basically describing Earth's atmosphere. If you want to have an Earth-like scream, you need an Earth-like atmosphere. You need enough pressure for those sound waves to travel in the same way that you are hearing me right now. Oh, kind of. When you get to space-like pressures, they are so low, Han, that you wouldn't be able to hear them in the same way that we hear sounds here on Earth. Sounds can still travel in space, but not in the same way like you are hearing me. Give me that Venus, Venus voice. voice. Ho, 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 ho. Fantastic. Our next comment comes from Ruiman90, who says, so theoretically, if two astronauts were using those cups with strings that kids in kindergarten made, they would be able to hear each other, right? Where's the Expanse writers team? I got an episode for them. I got an idea for them. Yes, theoretically, you are describing a tin can telephone, which uses just two tin cans with string connecting them. So you make a sound into the tin can, which vibrates the can, which vibrates the string and travels mechanically along the string and then gets transduced the other way, kind of like the astronauts touching their helmets together. Theoretically, yes, a tin can telephone would work in space. How cool is that? Also, the Expanse team already knows that, in fact, because there's an episode where two Martian Marines are on the surface of Ganymede and they touch their helmets together because their comms fail and they're yelling at each other and they can still kind of hear each other. That's why the Expanse is so good. Watch it. I have a ship. Lightning round over, because the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Kai Honek, who says similarly, 
all the things that you all were saying about explosions in space, but Kai puts it in a really cool and interesting way. Um, for example, he says, to put into perspective, an X-wing weighs roughly 10,000 kilograms, and if we assume that blasters are capable of vaporizing half that mass, uh, that's around 5,000 kilograms of vaporized fuel, air, and durasteel, still accurate, <laughs> that's rapidly expanding in a cloud away from the point of explosion. If your ship is anywhere near that event, pieces ranging from microscopic particles to small chunks would hit your fuselage Lodge or cockpit canopy and transfer their energy into the glass transparasteel. Wow, very nerdy. Which would vibrate enough to transfer into the air in the cockpit and then to your ears and register as a sound. Interestingly, because of the lack of air, a sound would actually reach you faster in the void than it would in an atmosphere. All this might apply to engines as well, depending on how much mass they're throwing out. Wow. That's a lot of mostly accurate stuff about science and Star Wars. And for that, Kai, oh, the nerdiest of the nerd I bestow upon you. No! Yeah, didn't set it up in the same way. Gotta keep you on your T's. But of course, I'm not always right. I went to a friend's wedding, and the first thing I did was congratulate the wrong woman. So what did I get wrong <laughs> last week? I did. I went right up to her and I hugged her and I said, congratulations. And she's like, I'm not this person's name. And I was like, all right, guess I'll just go play in the river. And so I did. There was a tire swing above a river and I just swung in it and I didn't talk to anyone. <laughs> Our first correction comes from Randy Owens, who says, hey, Kyle, it's me again. Oh, I've been waiting for this day who says uh, 10,000 kilometers is not longer than the width of the Earth. It is longer than the radius of Earth, which is what you were probably thinking of. In the episode, I said that the average interaction distance in our solar system for uh, air-like particles could be as long as 10,000 kilometers, which is very, very long. And I said that is longer than the Earth is wide, which is not explicitly true. The Earth is over 12,000 kilometers wide diameter wise. And so 10,000 kilometers is obviously less than that. I was just going within an order of magnitude kind of thing, but I did say it's longer than the Earth is wide, which is technically incorrect, the worst kind of incorrect. I, I, maybe morally incorrect is probably worse. Ethically? Uh, our next correction comes from Tyler Petrus, Ross Gaynor, and others who say there is actually an opposite of helium, as I stated in the episode. It's like xenon, or specifically sulfur hexafluoride. That makes you sound like you're breathing in the opposite of helium. You are correct. Although I did not mention it, there is an opposite of helium in terms of the, what it does to your voice, just like uh, Titan or Venus would do to your voice, what you would sound like. The speed of sound in something like sulfur hexafluoride, which is a gas, is much, much lower than it is in normal Earth air. Similarly, it's very, very low in xenon, if you've ever seen anyone breathe in those kinds of gases. You can see Adam Savage here, friend of the show and my legal guardian, breathe in sulfur hexafluoride, and look what it does to him. And my voice gets really low, although somehow I'm still funny. It's scientific! <laughs> yeah, so you don't have to go to the surface of another planet to sound like you're on Venus or on Titan. You can just breathe in this stuff. But don't do that. Don't try to breathe in very heavy gases because mm, they can kill you. Our next correction comes from frequent commenter Shinjiji, who says, there's a part of me that hasn't understood why sci-fi movies and shows haven't gone the route of Gundam. Uh, like it, the series or not, it decided to go with the idea where the machines have pre-recorded audio for sounds like rifle fire, explosions, thrusters, and then play them to the pilot in stereo. Since sound is such a key thing to combat, you want to know how far ships away are, etc. It would make sense to go this way in general. Okay, so I had no idea. I loved Gundam as a kid growing up. I had the little toys that you construct from uh, the, the, the model sets and stuff, but I haven't been keeping up with Gundam, and I didn't know this fact, and I think it is brilliant. What a cool, sciencey, sci-fi thing to do. Yes, I, I, I totally buy that. If you were in space because the sounds of the explosions and what your own suit was doing maybe wouldn't come uh, to your ears in the same way that you're used to when you went through uh, military training or any kind of thing on Earth or on another planet, since those sounds would be so important to how your brain processes uh, distance and time and what your suit was actually doing, I think that is a fantastic uh, idea that makes a lot of sense. You go, Gundam. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this one is a pretty rough one. 
And it goes to Opal Dragon, who says, uh, I think you came close to creating a red herring with this episode since you left out the key reason for screaming, which I think is a big part of the phrase. Why does any life form scream? But there is one more aspect to the phrase I believe everyone might be missing. It's time. Even if you get some form of scream to travel through space, would anyone even hear it in time if you found a loophole to get a detectable scream out? Is that not the spirit of the phrase in space? No one can hear you scream? Was it not you? in a movie that meant to scare you, to magnify the feeling of being alone and trapped? I have never seen that phrase used in a romantic space comedy. So if you are trapped in space, if your ship's communications are down and life support has six hours of power left and you are two light years from the nearest space station, or do you have a way out of that? Oh, whoa, 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 Opal Dragon. Whoa, cool your thrusters, pal. Look, this is a science show. I know that there's different meanings behind different words and phrases, but we went with the more sciency, trying to be more accurate one, trying to evaluate it within the context of the movie and space and science. Yes, why does organism scream is important. And could anyone actually hear your scream is important. And I do have a way out of what you just said. But hey, Opal Dragon, whew, I like your enthusiasm. Even though you accuse me of putting a red herring in my episode on purpose. Oh, I'm sorry to have suggest the red herring thing. That would be my only criticism for the show. Other than that, it was great. <laughs> oh, never mind, man. You are indeed a super nerd. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're a lady. Now, if you are already subscribed to Alpha, which you can do at projectalpha.com, you <laughs> know what the... <laughs> wow, you know it because you saw the next episode of Because Science two days earlier than anyone else, and you saw other premium content from myself, Nerdist, and Geek and Sundry, like Relics and Rarities. Ooh, lucky you, but if you haven't subscribed to Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science is... What are the most evil plants that Poison Ivy could control? That's right, on this week's episode of Because Science, just in time for Valentine's Day, we are thinking about flowers and plants and what things that Poison Ivy could use to wrap up heroes and villains alike to cause the most discomfort and pain possible. I never liked the fact that Poison Ivy only used vines and trees. If she had complete control over plants, there are so many better options than just a simple vine. So much more devious and devilish and evil uh, mm, plants. Even poison ivy itself would be better, but can evolution do even better than just poison ivy? Spoiler alert. Yes. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science Yet, all about how to hear a scream in space, yes really, and leave me all your best comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Oh, <laughs> that indicates Instagram and Twitter. And don't forget, a hagfish in the hand is worth two buckets of slime in the bush. Where is the closest research facility? Someone get me. Oh, I gotta get one. <laughs>